Hi, can everybody hear me okay in the back there? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, there's me. I'm also a bass player, so I thought I'd throw up an inter a different picture there. Uh, I am, uh, I work at Vibe Networks, and I am a NetBSD developer. So, um, Are you tuning high C or low B? Sorry? High C or low B? Tuning. Uh, the fifth string is a low B. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm not really a big fan of higher strings on a bass. I mean, it's a bass, you know, it's, we don't want no treble around here. Come on. It's like, what do you do, Dave? Exactly. <laughs> I also play guitar, you know, and when I want to, you know, when I want to play up there, I'll pick up the Les Paul, you know, come on. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about me. I, my first program was in 1968. Um, it was actually in high school, uh, Fortran 4 coding sheets that went down into the basement. I always imagined that it was a door there, you know, and somebody in the hood, you know, sort of opened it this much and took the coding sheets and magic happened and they gave you back a deck of cards and, uh, and, the, uh, and the printouts. Uh, so, and I didn't do much after that for a while. Uh, but eventually I got back, I got into computers and I worked with a number of technology companies. Uh, uh, Monarch Marking, I did a lot of work uh, programming uh, sc barcode scanners and readers and, and setting up uh, companies, you know, to basically to use our printers because, you know, our primary product was printers. Not true, actually, the primary product was printer stock. <laughs> we sold our printers so that we could keep selling stock. Um, I program primarily in C and Python, mostly Python now, but, uh, you know, a little bit of C uh, as well. Uh, the usual every programming language I ever smelled uh, on there, and uh, I'm published by Academic Press in uh, this book here, which is probably out of print by now, Software Solutions in C. Uh, I'm an FBSD developer, as I said. I'm a contributor to PostgreSQL. I, I used to pro uh, uh, contribute a lot of code. I, I just found out recently that I'm technically still uh, developer, I still have uh, access to the tree, but I haven't done anything for many years. And uh, anybody use PostgreSQL here? Um, you ever use? Connected, so uh, keeping track of uh, who's actually on the system so we can send them a bill, very difficult. Every time a new feature was added, the system just got worse. Um, also, because it was, a, you know, this was back in the 90s, it was a new uh, thing, and, you know, every day somebody said, you know what it should do, and, you know, was, you know I'm sure you've all been there. We said, no, you can't do that, and then you know, go in the back with the other programmers for five minutes and come back and say, okay, we figured out how to do it. 
Uh, took over Internex Online. Any ex Internex Online people here? This was a bigger group than us. I mean, we had something. We, we took, they, they actually uh, had some financial problems. We wound up taking them over and, uh, and merging them in with us. So it, it increased our base. And they had their own system. Many disconnected Perl scripts, uh, flat file uh, database. Um, the, it, 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 was, it worked, it was not bad, uh, but it still it required the personal involvement in the day-to-day -day of the chief programmer to keep everything running well. So out of all that, I came up with these requirements. Control everything from one database, as I said. I want billing to be incorporated into the uh, operations, but still be able to hand, handle some ad hoc billing. Uh, both in recurring billing that didn't really fit the billing operations uh, uh, paradigm, and one of you know we you know so we we just sold uh, this guy some software programming. We got to charge him three hundred dollars. We needed our system. Um, wanted to be modular. So as I grew and found other pe people to use this. Uh, I can see going into some place and they say, yeah, we love it all, and that's, you know, it's kind of an okay GL you have, but we have this GL we, you know, on our mainframe and we paid like six million dollars for and we don't want to throw it out. I want to be able to merge them. Uh, even though it's modular, I wanted all the components to be consistent, so once you worked in one area, it didn't look like you were working on, you know, different, different systems. They were all basically the same system. Uh, robust, of course. Uh, well, you know, every project pretty much, you know, has those requirements, all, all those bottom ones. You're robust, open, so open source com components, of course, I wanted because I'm an open source guy. Commodity hardware, because I didn't want to be locked into a specific uh, uh, supplier. Uh, user, i.e. administrator friendly, and configurable. So, I put together, uh, and this wasn't overnight, obviously, but uh, eventually, I came up with this. So I'm using NetBSD and Package Source. Uh, anybody know about uh, Net Package Source? Is similar to Ports. I think it's better. I gave it actually the last time I gave a talk here was on Package Source and how it's better than uh, Ports. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's very good for you know for helping me organize all the programs that I have and keeping them up to date and everything else. I mean, you could, the same thing can happen on on FreeBSD, of course. And in fact. My system used to run on FreeBSD. Actually, started out on NetBSD, moved to FreeBSD when someone took it over for a few years, and then I moved it back to NetBSD afterwards. Um, using Python for the main programming language, uh, using PostgreSQL and PyGreSQL, which I'm the chief maintainer for, uh, Apache asterisk for the phone service, uh, Postfix and Dovecot for SMTP and IMAP, uh, Subversion and RSync uh, to keep track of all the code and the necessary files, and to keep systems in sync um, uh, across all, all the, the various servers that are running this. Why NetBSD? Well, first of all, I'm a fan of BSD in general. That's why I'm here. Yay, BSD. <laughs> uh, I'm a NetBSD developer. You know, I say eat your own breakfast. I like the package system. I think it's a really uh, clean code base. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you don't have as many developers as FreeBSD. I don't see that as necessarily a, necessarily a bad thing. I can see that as could be a feature, right size developer base, I call it. And the developers are really, really anal about correctness. I mean, I've had a, a number of things that was functional that somebody said, no, no, not until you fix it, until it's perfectly correct. Here's the right way to do it. And I had to back it out and put it back in again the right way. So I like the, I like the NetBSD community. And I like the general BSD community uh, that it's part of. PostgreSQL, it's open source. Dr. Michael Stonebreaker uh, from, uh, created Ingress way back in the, I guess it was the 70s, 80s. Uh, Andrew Yu and Jolly Chen took it over when Ingress went um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, it was picked up by, um, I can't remember the name of the company now. <coughs> but. Uh, it, it went commercial, uh, changed the name to Postgres. Uh, actually, it was Postgres before they took it over. They changed it to Postgres 95 as sort of a take on Windows 95 uh, for some reason. Uh, it's got a BSD type license, so yay BSD. 
And it's an enterprise level, it's fully acid compliant uh, and just very strong. The name eventually changed to PostgreSQL uh, because the original language was not SQL. It was uh, Ingress, uh, Dr. Stonebreaker invented his own language, but due to the popularity of SQL, they just changed the language on top of it. The engine stayed the same, very powerful. Python, I like that, it's easy to learn. It's interpreted, but it's very fast. It's comprehensive, it's got lots of packages and modules that you can either come with it or you can download. Uh, Object-oriented, clean style, executable pseudocode. I mean, it's what, uh, you know, the idea is that you write something out, you know, say, well, listen, the program should do something like this, and you write it out and you indent uh, the, the stuff that's part of a block, and, you know, and, and when you're done, it almost looks like Python. And, uh, and again, BSD type license, yay BSD. <laughs> System components, uh, general ledger, accounts receivable. My wife thinks it should be a cat, by the way, but yeah, that's what I found on the net. Um, accounts payable, billing, ISP management, and most of the top stuff, you know, pretty standard stuff. The billing is a little bit different than the ISP management, of course, is completely uh, uh, custom. This is a basic idea of how the, uh, the system is set up. Um, I just have to remember to keep track of the time. I, I, I did never got a chance to time my talk, so as I get close to the end, I'm either going to really talk really, really fast, which means that uh, it's, it's longer than it should have been, or I'm gonna be begging for questions, which means it's shorter than it should have been. <laughs> um, so we have this, you know, clients uh, have transactions which go on to invoices. Uh, uh, they have service groups, which is the stuff that they buy uh, they have recurring billing, um, service groups uh, are based on service definitions, um, service group has a billing ID, which is basically the group in, in Unix, and account, which is basically the user account in Unix. That's where the mailboxes are and other web pages and other services that we offer. But we can have an enterprise could have one service group and then all their employees could be users and they manage that separately because they have access to that one there. Billing, as I said, we have service definitions and pricing. By the way, if, if there's more detail on this in the paper which I'm gonna make available on uh, the site. Some of you, if you're academics, you may not think it's a real paper because there's no footnotes in it because I hate footnotes. <laughs> I, uh, I like to read, you know, if it's important enough to say, put it in the damn text. You know, don't make somebody, make it look like a, a vertical tennis match. <laughs> um, service definitions and pricing uh, are defined in one place. Account types, talk about the various things you can buy. Uh, you know, virtual domain, basic web, uh, uh, yearly, monthly, um, extra uh, web with extra storage, uh, all, you know, whatever you can describe in, in the tables goes in there. Uh, the service groups and accounts, as I explained, basically GID and UID. Uh, in fact, that's the actual table field names for them. Um, service instances, you know, somebody buys a phone. They get a service instance of a phone. And, and then they have, you know, it has, a, part of the definition is how much we charge for extra minutes and how many minutes are included. And if it's, you know, Canada or North America or world, you know, whatever. Uh, has transactions which go on to invoices, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, right there. Uh, service definitions have the description of the product, the base price, any extra charges. So the base price may say, um, uh, for instance, on a, on a, on a virtual, uh, on a, a basic web, we may say you get uh, it includes one email address, mailbox. And if you want more, they're $3 a month more or whatever. Um, you know, so some of the higher price ones might say, you know, you get 30 mailboxes and you pay for extra mailboxes above the 30. Uh, input format so that when you're defining it, again, we, we don't know what people are gonna sell tomorrow because we deal with salesmen. <clears throat> We're usually selling our product before we've created it. So, 
we want to be able to describe the product in such a way that the input screen is also defined. Um, so for, for, the, like for a phone service, you need the phone number and for uh, you know, some other stuff, we have a NetTasker product. Uh, we need to know which instance it is. You know, so we allow them to put in whatever fields they want in the description and when the administrator goes to add that, it simply comes up with uh, that definition. I think I have some examples going forward. Uh, yeah, here, yeah, here's here's a serve added service. So this is a, a residential 50 megabit ADSL service. Uh, uh, ADSL residential light speed 50 megabyte is the description that goes on the invoice. It's uh, it's a group service. We apply tax. Well, we always apply. We we actually have a different way of doing that, so that field's going to go away. Um, it can be edited by the group leader, and we can have multiple. So, you know, somebody wants two 50 megabit services on the same service, uh, no problem, we can do that. Uh, the base unit is each, could be megabits, could be 100 megabits, could be, you know, uh, megabytes, uh, st storage, uh, gigabytes, whatever. We just put there what the actual unit is, again, for the description on the invoices and on the administrator screen. Which GL account goes in, because we have a, a full accounting system, so when we charge something, this service, we charge it to connectivity revenue. And commission code means if, some, if we're giving commissions to someone, they get the connectivity one, which might be less because we don't make as much money on it, so we may not give the, as high a commission on that as we do on something like you know, web hosting, which, you know, not free, but certainly not we don't have, to, you know, the next customer doesn't cost us the whole amount again. And this is where we define, you know, here we need a login and password. So we can keep track of their login and password in case they call us up and say, I can't connect. And say, well, go into your router, here's your login, here's your password. And the idea of the blank space in between means that it goes on a different line. If, it, if there was no blank space, that the, the input screen would have login password. Um, with with the um, uh, the space there, it's just login password. So we have some control over that. We can put it, you know, do, so we can make the screen look more or less what we want. Uh, account types, we define the package. Talk about the term and the billing. Most of the terms are one or twelve, you know, monthly or yearly. It allows for others. We never use them. Uh, Exceptions to the default pricing. So we have all the default pricing for the storage, the mailboxes, you know, how much is included, everything. But we can say for this particular one, instead of including uh, the default of say, five gigabytes of storage, we can say this one includes 50 gigabytes of storage. Obviously the price would be higher. Um, and the basic components that are included. Do they have a web page? Do they have email? Do they have Check, 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 just check boxes, which is, for example, here's account type 101, which is our virtual domain Soho Monthly. Small office, home office, for those who don't know what Soho means. <laughs> um, it's uh, commission code, in this case is ISP services. Uh, there's our base price, we don't charge anything for setup. If we did, that would go under uh, the setup GL account, but uh, but uh, there's the ISP services GL account for when we sell this product. Uh, period is monthly. As I say, we used to have a field there where you just put in the number of months of the term. But since it was only ever one or 12, I just changed the drop down to be monthly or yearly and it puts a one or a 12 into the database. Um, included, <laughs> I don't know what's included. <laughs> I've never really noticed that before. <laughs> I put it in there, but I don't remember. Um, and what shell they get by default, you know, the bash as a default, they can, you know, we can put anything we want in there. And I'll get to why that's important a little bit later. Um, these are uh, all the default um, uh, amounts for the various things, so if they want you know, the 10 megabit service, it's $43. If we had a special price for this particular account, this, this would be in a different format 
and we would be able to put a number in there. Uh, you know, usually this number is the same in this case because you know, if $36 for one, well, the second one is also $36. Am I going too fast, too slow? Anybody have any questions as we go? Just uh, jump in there because I think I'm going to be really short. <laughs> so I'll be begging for questions. <laughs> Okay. When you were talking about the, um, the UI before, uh, can you tell a little bit more about the data structures or what you have to do to... The, to this, U, this UI? That one or, or the one before. Like, are, are you, have you created a tool where you use the structure from the database to uh, present the elements in the UI? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, the, um, yeah, the, the, we have many tables and this, this display comes from reading the account type table for the basic stuff and then throwing in the service definitions, um, throwing in the specific, you know, the, 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 the ones that are special, you know, that are not the default ones uh, here. So uh, I should have probably uh, tried to find something that had a, a different one there, but, you know, it's further down. Uh, Yes. Well, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure there's some stuff there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think offhand what they might be. I mean, every, everything that you need to administer the account is certainly on here. Um, I mean, there's things like last update and you know stuff like that, which you know don't show up here because they're used internally. But you know anything that you're going to need to create it is definitely going to be here. Uh, did I skip something? Accounts. I was looking for a picture of some user using account. I came across this one. I thought that'd be cool. Some some girl using her Commodore 64. I have no idea what year that is. I'm sure that. That girl, that girl's probably older than me. <laughs> uh, I don't know how long ago this was. Maybe not, but, but you know, certainly around my age. She's certainly no kid anymore. Um, so accounts have individual mailboxes. So each account is a mailbox. Each account is a web page, which may be the virtual web page, if they're the, you know, the the main account on that service group. <clears throat> It has the user feature, so the user can go in and set various things. Um, for instance, they can pick a, a, a feature that says display my, display my information on your who's on our system page. You know, we don't put them there automatically. If you want to be on there, you go here, here's the description that I want. And if you go on one of our pages, it says, uh, you know, who's using our system, Boom, all these people. and which we check for rude stuff every once in a while. <laughs> um, and it holds and controls all the resources, which we count at some point. Uh, did I, have I already been on this slide? Service instance. Oh, no, service instance. So you can attach a service interest, in, instance to a group. So again, a phone, um, a, uh, a modem, uh, a DSL uh, service, uh, whatever, you attach it, you have things like uh, details, like when is, it also it tracks when is it due, um, how much is used, and, and then all of that's used at the end of the month. We suck that out, put it onto a transaction, the transaction becomes an invoice, Thanks to Carol every morning, who goes through and invoices everything, pretty much pressing a button. But uh, so far, we're small enough that we like to eyeball it before we send them out. <laughs> so um, we, the transactions are created based on the accounts and the services. So we look and see you know, how much storage did they use. Did they go over their allocated storage? We charge for that. We make a transaction. Uh, did they, you know, obviously for the, the basic service, you know, whatever it is for the monthly, they get a charge for that. Uh, if they got additional services, DSL, we add that on. And then they get one invoice with all, a deta all the details and <clears throat> of what they used. And then it marks it as, you know, 
due the following month. Uh, seems pretty basic. We're, I'm going to get into the, like the, the, the cool stuff in a moment, so I'm expecting to slow down in a moment when I get to the, in a couple of slides. Uh, the services, of course, the, the transactions, of course, and the invoices are attached to clients, so we know who's going to be billing them. Uh, and, and they're added to the AR import table. Remember, before I said everything is modular, we don't just take those invoices and plug them into their respective tables in the accounts receivable. We have one table that has all of the import records for the accounts receivable. If we use our own accounts receivable, then that module goes and reads that table and plugs it into uh, the proper tables in, in its own system. If, if they have their own accounts receivable system, then we just write some code that goes in and reads our database and exports it to their system with their help, obviously. Uh, I've, I've never heard of an ISP that offered that before. What's that? Well, not the customer's AI. Like, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting if, if another enterprise wanted to run an ISP using our system, yeah. and they, so they took our ISP module and said, yeah, the billing module makes sense. Um, they may want to use their own AR. They may want to use their own GL. I mean, obviously, if they use their own AR, they're also using their own GL. But, you know, they may want to have, you know, it manage. Actually, I guess they could actually use their own AR and use our GL. But chances are, if they're that big, they're probably using their own GL, too. Sorry? Oh, sorry, yes, yes. Uh, AR is accounts receivable, AP is accounts payable, GL is general ledger. Uh, sorry, I know, <laughs> not, a, not an accounting group out here. Um, I just had to learn all these things. They're second nature to me now because I had to, I had to program them all. Um, so the ISP management, now, here's, here's where we fix a lot of the problems I talked about at the beginning. So we want to have web pages. <clears throat> so who gets a web page? Well, people who are paying for them. Actually, not necessarily. We may have complementary accounts, but they're in our system and we're tracking them and we know that we have complementary accounts. We can take a look at all the complementary accounts and see if we're giving too much away. But if they're not in our system, they don't have a web page. And that's because the web server, which is a completely separate server, goes into the database and says, has anything changed in the tables that I care about? That's why I say one of the uh, fields uh, I was talking about in the, uh, the databases, database tables has is the last updated. So automatically when you update a table, a field changes and we have system, a way of looking to see has something changed since the last time I generated the web page configuration. Yes, suck down everything I need, create the Apache config, uh, whatever other tables have to, um, uh, files have to be created. <laughs> restart the Apache web server, and now everybody who has paid for the service is now got a web page. Um, we have in the database, we have the ability to tell which is the main account, and we can alter and say, you know, but we don't want the main account to be the, web, the virtual web page. So the, the, the virtual account, the domain attached to the service group, not the account, um, uh, can be serviced by any one of the accounts underneath it. We default to the first one, and they can adjust that to whichever one they want, which, uh, including on some server other than ours. We can point, we can just point it to some other server if they want. Uh, it's pull technology, as I said. You know the the mailboxes. We create, you know, basically user accounts on the mail server uh, based on well, everybody has a mailbox. So if they have an account in the system and it's active, then they get a mailbox. Uh, if we turn off the account, the mailbox goes away. If we turn off the service group, all the mailboxes under that service group go away. If we turn off the client, all the service groups and all the, you know, uh, as you go down. So nobody gets something unless they're paying for it, or at least we know that they're not paying for it. Question. Yep. Do you have any kind of version control, like you have a, an undo capability? So if somebody does a deletion with Cascade, like you just described, you can back it out? Uh, a, a deletion, 
Oh, no, yes, yes, it, it, we don't actually delete anything. We never delete, <laughs> I'm a database person, we never delete anything. We just go, <laughs> you're not active anymore, click. <laughs> so some, somebody's not paying their bill, we go to the client, go click, <laughs> and <laughs> everything disappears. Because it's all pull technology, you know, the, the, the web server doesn't care about what's going on in the database, it just says, I don't have an active account, so I'm not, I'm not gonna create a web page for this person. The guy comes running and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, here's my check, here's my check, here's my hell. Okay, great, click it on. All the service groups, all the accounts are active again. They were always there, they just, we just wouldn't let them trickle down to the, to the servers. Yes, uh, things happen, we make transactions. We don't, we don't change, very seldom change a, a database table. Uh, yeah, some basic stuff, yeah, like name, address, you know, we'll do that. And even then we keep track of events, you know, you know we change this guy's address, so-and-so changed this guy's address from this to this. So that's in our uh, A trail, we call it our events. It's basically an A trail. Um, configs are stored locally. So, um, so the, the, the web server, the mail server, uh, the voice system, the, the, you know, like the, the, the phone system, they all pull their information, they create the configs and everything's running fine and suddenly the administration machine goes down. Maybe we took it down to do an upgrade or whatever. Um, doesn't matter. The uh, servers say, oh, time to check to see if anything needs to be upgraded. Can't get to it. Oh well, I'll just keep what I have. And it just keeps what it has in the configs until the admin machine comes back up it says, well, oh, okay, let's see if there's anything new now, and it, uh, and it gets it updated. So everything is in independent. If the mail server goes down, the web pages still stay up. Uh, you know, uh, nothing is dependent. No one machine takes down the whole system. Um, individual servers do the kind. So, uh, for example, uh, the phone service. Minutes are counted every time somebody makes a call. We track the minutes, it goes into a, into a database table, uh, CDR records, and uh, at some point we go through the un, uh, uh, un, unchecked ones and, and put a price on them. So we say, oh, they, that's, we charge one and a half cents for Canada, and we do all that. We don't worry about what included minutes at that point. We just put each record how much it would cost if they were paying for that particular call. Monthly, we count all those, uh, but we say, oh, but that account gets uh, 1,000 free minutes, so don't even worry about the first 1,000 that are included. You know, like if they make a call to Europe, no, that doesn't count in 1,000. They skip that one, uh, and, uh, and then at the end, they charge for the Europe one, European one and any overages they have, and that all goes in. Um, storage, we just have little scripts that go daily and check and see how much uh, storage people are using in their database, in their email, their web page, whatever, whatever we're charging for storage for. And uh, sometimes you have to check them manually or, or semi-manually. Uh, we cannot get our DSL uh, um, distributor to, to give us something in an electronic form that we can just apply and look at our, our database and see if it's right. So we get the invoice once a month <laughs> You know, it's got all the, the different accounts, and poor Carol here has to sit down and go through the database, you know, the, the records in the database, and make sure that we're charging for everything that's on there. So some of it is, is kind of manual. That sounds like a callback to the keynote, that there should be regulation that a DSL provider... <laughs> there ought to be a lot. You know, I'm just not a fan of there ought to be a law automatically. <laughs> You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm more of a fan of there should not be a law, <laughs> which would solve a lot of the problems that we're seeing, right? We don't need a law for everything. Um, and yeah, we definitely don't need a law for that. Well, we, we'll deal with it. I mean, the marketplace will take care of it. If, if, every, if, if they lose business because they can't, you know, if we get too big and Carol just can't handle it anymore, we just say, listen, we gotta go find another supplier because you can't give us what we want. And they'll either say, hold on, <laughs> you know, get their programmers busy, and uh, next thing you know, they're giving us what we need, or we go someplace where, you know, they can handle it. It's the free market. <laughs> if, if there's competition. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there is competition. I mean, we're not with Bell. We're with uh, a smaller supplier who uses Bell, obviously. Um, 
but we, you know, we could go to like Tech Savvy or you know one of the others. This is not a hmm? me. Oh, okay, <laughs> me a card. You never know. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> Here's a case study: phone service. This is the actual phone. Well, one of the actual phones that we uh, we use. Uh, very nice, actually. Uh, it's it, it self provisions. So the reason we use this. I mean, we looked at some of the other big name ones, uh, and none of them really self provision very well, unless you're big enough to buy, you know, tons of phones and have the, the them uh, chips made specifically for you. For you're buying one or two here and there, you know, you want to buy something off the shelf, and and that and what happens is the, we buy these, the MAC address is sent to the. Um, uh, the manufacturer who puts it into their database that we have bought this one and when you plug it in it, it calls home finds out that oh Vibe Networks is the one that's going to provision this so it sends them a configuration that says you get your configuration from Vibe Networks and the thing says fine hangs up and then reconnects uh, I think reboots actually comes up and says, uh, oh, I have a configuration from here. Oh, it's different than the one I have, obviously. So it installs, and what we do is we send a, a short one that has a really long key in it um, that, that is, is used to encrypt any configs going to that particular phone. Uh, and they say, fine, they reboot, they come back up. Now the second time, because we know we've already sent them that key, we send them the real configuration encrypted they use the key to decrypt it, and so now we've got a secure phone, and you know, by the time it's done, done this dance, and it's all, they just plug it in. They, they don't have to go in and set anything up, do anything, no, just, they just plug it in, and it's ready. Within a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, it's rebooted a few times, and comes up, and hello, <laughs> they have a phone. So, so we added objects to the system of a the phone, they described the details of the service, 1,000 minutes, North America, Canada, on net, whatever. Uh, the Astro server pulls the phone details out of the database, creates the Apache configs, the extensions, uh, the, um, the voicemail box information, um, you know, all the, the basic stuff that we've hard, you know, some headers and footers for everything. And the phones are auto provisioned, as I described. And then we use the CDR records, they just go into the PostgreSQL database and just one record every time a call is made and then other systems we don't we don't try to do too much at the time of the call we go in later on and run through it and see what has to be uh, maintained so uh, the summary <laughs> based on open source very important to us one control panel so so the admins go in they can bring up clients, and we got, you know, there's one control panel that handles everything in the system. They don't have to go in and configure a user on the mail server, the web server, phone, nothing like that. If it's in the database, it's in the administrative system, and everything runs from there. Uh, one control panel for the users, so they can go in and change their password, um, add themselves to, you know, various features. Um, uh, the uh, you know, we have, we have two, we actually have two mailing lists for our users and uh, we require that the primary user on every service group has to be in at least one of them. So we put them in what we call our MOTD one, which is supposed to be a message of the day, doesn't, winds up being, you know, every, every few weeks if we're lucky. Um, and we just send out uh, the message to that and they read it and they say fine. And then we have another one which we call Vibrant, which gets exactly the same messages, but it's an open mailing list, so they can actually discuss us uh, on our mailing list. So we kind of have to be a little confident before we do that, and not, not a lot of places will do that. Um, but some people don't just get, don't want to be involved in the discussions. It's too technical for them, so, you know, they don't have to be on anyone, on any mailing list, unless they're the primary user, in which case we want to be able to say, hey, there's a change coming, you know, somebody at your uh, office needs to know about it. Um, everything's tracked in the database. <clears throat> Easy remote management because it's all web-based, so I could bring it up here, and you know, I could uh, disable David Maxwell, you know, because <laughs> I don't like the way he's looking at me right now. <laughs> uh, and 
And that's it. It's a NetBSD project, obviously, as I talked about. And uh, I'm going to be like right on time if uh, we didn't start late. <laughs> um, and there I am with my partner. We, I, we actually were VexNet, uh, which uh, uh, was myself. He had a, an operation called Vibe Networks, uh, which was, uh, he's more of a marketing person and, uh, and also uh, he brings companies public, hopefully. Uh, so it was a good fit, so we got together and merged our stuff into it. Uh, I wound up being the majority partner, so I got to have my say in how <laughs> things are run and, you know, so we didn't push everything over onto a Windows box, you know. <laughs> and uh, there's our details. And that's it. So I need lots of questions because we're running way ahead of schedule. <laughs> Config management? Sorry, I don't know the right term for this is somebody will carve but something like Ansible Salt Chef in lieu of, like, I'm assuming you're cobbling happens by hand. Yeah, but I mean, it's very structured. Understood, but we now have these tools. Have you thought about integrating them at all? Every time I've looked at a tool that does it, like, you know, like everybody says, use cPanel, it does everything. Well, it doesn't. I mean, I've looked at it. It's not really what, that's not a fair analogy, though. Okay. Right, but we don't need to worry about that because we're not managing these uh, pages individually. We're not going into the web server and setting up. I understand, but to the degree you're reinventing the wheel because you're doing, because the way you're doing it. I'm just wondering if you've considered it because I'm sort of going through the same thing right now. And yeah. it, it sort of seems silly to recreate things that exist. That We've never found anything that does exactly what we want as flexibly as we want. Uh, I know at open source you can go in and, and change it yourself, but... Uh, I mean, with all this stuff, it's always the parade, right? 80-20. You can find something that does 80% of what you want, to write that last 20% costs 80% writing the whole thing anew. Mm. It's very iterative. Yeah. Or recursive. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is something I didn't, I didn't build this overnight either. You know, it's, no. uh, you know, started off in, you know, in the 90s and it's progressed, you know, and, you know. So if you had a clean slate today, what would, would you do anything differently? Yeah, if I had a clean slate, I mean, yes, if I was starting with a clean slate, um, I would set up the structures maybe a little bit differently. Um, not too much, I mean, because uh, a lot of the ways that I did stuff, was, because it's all in a database that I control and I know the format and the structures of it, um, when I've had to make major changes to the underlying structure of the database, there's always been a way of migrating from one to the other. Uh, sometimes a little more painful than others, but it's always been possible. Um, uh, again, because it's like my stuff, right? I, I know exactly how to, to make that, uh, that jump. Um, there's maybe a... I, I guess if, if I was starting from scratch, there's a few things I would do. One of the things is the features I talked about, I want to put that into the service table. Again, it's something I can do uh, over time. Uh, it's not that hard. Uh, just, you know, be nice if I had just started off that way to begin with, you know, instead of having two different systems for tracking adjustments to things, have uh, one place and just have a flag that says, you know, this is a group thing or this is a, a, a user thing. In fact, I even have that. If you look at that slide, you're going to find that slide. Uh, yeah. <coughs> See, a uh, group edit uh, flag uh, means that the, the group leader can edit it. Um. Yeah, you're, t you're touching on something interesting that we've run against, which is we'll have wholesalers, resellers, which are slightly different, but then we'll also have like, IT consultants that manage multiple accounts that aren't necessarily wholesale, wholesale or resell. So you, you don't have the same hierarchical relationship you think you do, and it, it becomes very difficult very quickly yeah. to manage. 
So. Yeah, by group it, I mean like the group that has maybe, you know, their employees are there, the accounts underneath it. That's what I mean by a group. Right, right. <clears throat> We also have a client above that, so the client can have multiple service groups, so the client can have that control too. Yeah, so, so yeah, and that's what we struggled with is we have sort of the, the parent account, then various contacts, various sites, and various services, and these things are not hierarchical at all, but sometimes are. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, you do struggle with some of those uh, the relationships. One of the things is, um, uh, if you saw the... Uh, yeah. This is a very small, uh, isolated part of our ER chart. Uh, everybody know what an ER chart is? Okay. Uh, for those who don't know, entity relationship, it's, this is not a flow chart. This is a chart detailing the relationships between data objects. And, the, you know, that usually uh, uh, really becomes the database. Um, and so, you know, we worked out a, you know, the full chart, you know, every relationship, how it fits. We can see, oh, this doesn't really work there, you know, because we've got a loop, a data loop. You know, you can have a data loop as well as a flow loop. <clears throat> and we deal with all that stuff in the, in the ER chart, and then making the database becomes a simpler. We, we have a lot of like tables. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, that's. Yeah, you know, in a relational, uh, a relational da database, that's what you do. Actually, relational databases doesn't mean that tables relate to each other. It's asked, it actually de refers to relational algebra. <laughs> so, uh, how the. Uh, um, yeah. The, I was wondering, so you just, a lot of linking actually brought up, are you, do you look at event driven models for making modifications to each one of the individual components? In this relationship or? No, uh, well, event driven in a way. Uh, the um, you know ev the database is managed just just a uh, just a big control panel that you make changes to. Um, there are various things that run on various servers that count things, uh, you know, check things, uh, make sure that uh, something is not you know set up wrong. Um, but if you make a change in the database through the account the, the admin page automatically that updates the last update field in whatever table you've changed underneath you know you may not even know what it is the system knows oh you're changing the client table you're changing the you know the service table you know whatever table you're changing it updates automatically you know the database handles that you don't even there's not even any programming for that uh, the database updates that last update field and then the various servers, services that need to create configs, just, uh, you know, use, uh, you know, we have a subroutine that says, you know, I'm interested in this table, this table, this table, this table, and I am this function. You know, so, because the mail server is going to be interested in some of the same tables as the web server and the phone server. So, you say, phone, interested in these tables. And the subroutine just goes and says, mm, yeah, nothing's changed. Or, oh, something's changed. Now you have to go and re and then it just rebuilds everything. We don't try to figure out. Well, okay, we have to update this table, but leave that one alone. We just we just build the whole thing from scratch. So it's kind of event driven that way. There's some fun ways to do that because with Postgres you can create a table level trigger and you post exactly. message passing. Well, that's what we've done. It's it's it's, it's, it's an, uh, well, we don't do the message passing. We just poll is what I'm getting. Yes, yeah. Well, well, you do you don't unless you are on various in, independent machines. Yeah, as long as you can run it from the admin machine and, you know, I guess if the admin machine goes down, same effect. Well, you always have a master no matter which way you, you shape it, right? Yeah. So. Okay. Any other questions? Let's go back to that. Yes. Sorry, just... Sorry? Um, no, I think it's pretty complete. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, 
it's, I mean, it's, I run it on NetBSD. I, I don't know if there's that much that's really NetBSD specific. I just happen to like NetBSD. As I say, it ran on FreeBSD before. It could probably run on Linux. I hope it can't run on Windows. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as systems improve, you know, we, you know, we can use more. I can't think of anything offhand that we would do differently if we had another feature. Uh, are you thinking of anything in particular? Or? Yeah, yeah, because we don't care. Yeah, I mean, obviously we care about drivers, but we, you know, they're all, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if it's an Ethernet card and it works, you know, not sure what else we need. <laughs> It'd be nice if every server we had had the same Ethernet card that was make things a little bit simpler, but we deal with doing that because we, we also uh, distribute our, um, uh, like rc.conf is all, uh, you know, is mostly in one file with another file that includes that that says, yeah, my IP address is this and my name is this. Now go and get the usual stuff. And then, oh, on this machine, I also want to start, you know, Dovecot or, in the, or the phone server, or asterisk or whatever I'm, that machine is doing. Anything else? You can actually also use rc.conf.local for machine specific stuff if you want to actually locally distribute an rc.conf file. I tried to do that. The problem is, I didn't want, I wanted to have, I wanted to define the the interface first before calling anything, even rc.conf, which means I'd have to put something in rc.conf anyway. Um, so basically what I have now is rc.conf is um, my machine name, my IP, actually my IP address is just one number because I know what the, because I have two interfaces and I know what the net block is for, for those, those interfaces. And so the same last octet for both of them, one's an internal one. Uh, then I say, you know, basically source, you know, my RC, you know, my system rc.conf. And at that point, because it's, uh, and that's all in, CV, in, in subversion, so it's, it's maintained. And then, so once I'm there, it's my file anyway. It's not like I'm using the systemrc.conf, so I just add whatever I need to that one. I don't really need another rc.local. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. And uh, if anybody has any questions over, and if anybody has any gigs for me, I, you know, I'm always ready to play. <laughs> Uh, Coliseum. Okay. You know them? Yeah. But I now have my own AGAS and all that too. So hey? I now have my own AGAS and such as well. So okay. Where are you? Uh, 605. At 151. Sorry? At 151. Oh, okay. Used to be at 151. I know. You also used to be at 50 Richmond. I used to have Karen Fee in your gear. 50 Richmond? I don't think so. Maybe you're thinking of somebody else? Are oh, you thinking of I.O.? Uh, yeah, I yeah. yeah. 50 Richmond. 50 Richmond, no? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so 